Hi, it's Matthew McCaster here. Today, we're going to take a short look at a lesson by Aguado for classical guitar. This is a short piece, like a study, which focuses on a few key things and helps you build your technique and develop your playing. Now, Aguado was a Spanish composer, a late classical early romantic period composer, who wrote a lot of educational material for this instrument, a lot of studies, a lot of lessons, alongside some big heavyweight cornerstone works of that late classical early romantic period. He was born in Madrid, uh, but he spent a lot of his life in Paris. In fact, he moved to Paris where he met Fernando Sor, and if you study classical guitar, you definitely will know that name. He's another composer very similar to Aguado, a huge amount of study literature, but also some great big sonatas and, and larger pieces for the instrument. Aguado and Sor were great friends. They actually lived together for a time in Paris. So that's the type of music that we're, we're talking about today. Now this little lesson is a very simple piece by Aguado and you'll find a link to the music in the description of this video. It's freely available at many sources online. Aguado died in 1849, so this music is well within the public domain. So check the description and there you'll find a couple of links to a few freely available sources where you can download the music and try it for yourself. But first, let's hear how it sounds. <laughs> short and sweet. Really nice sounding piece. So one of the first things I want to do is work out where the melodic content is. And what Aguado does is he puts the most important melodic note on the first of every group of four sixteenth notes. Okay, so it's always on the beat. All right, so I'm going to highlight that. And what's good about this arpeggio pattern of P-I-M-I, or like I do, P-I-A-I, What's good about it is the thumb is controlling that first beat. And if the thumb's controlling that first beat, it can highlight it easy by just putting a little bit more weight on that stroke and lessening off the other fingers. So you can now hear that that first note in every group of four I'm highlighting it with a thumb. And that gives your audience something to follow, something to track as the piece develops. They can really focus on that melody. That becomes the thing that you're directing your audience to listen to. So that's the first thing I would concentrate on. The second thing is in measure three, we have quite a difficult fingering here. Finger four on fret four of the G string, and finger three on fret three of the B string. And until that point, we've had A minor, and we've had E major. So chords dominated by fingers one and two, and back in first position. So pretty easy, pretty standard stuff. But then in bar three, they have these really kind of weak fingers having to suddenly move across and play this whole arpeggio pattern. So watch what I do in measure two. I get my fingers three and four prepared. I get them into place really early, okay? So here we come to measure two. And my four and three, while I was playing measure two, they were hovering above the frets and the strings that they needed to go down. They weren't doing this. This is bad technique. The fingers are pointing up towards the ceiling. And then they have a huge distance to travel to get themselves to the fretboard, which means you can get dud notes, you get buzzes, you can get squeaks, or you get a huge big accent when you hit that chord because you're throwing your hand and putting a lot of weight with the left hand on. So that early preparation is really important. So that's one of the, the big things there. There's also another fingering you can use. I've seen a lot of people use this fingering. So you actually move the one and two that were doing the A minor and the E major. You move them up to the third position for that. I'm not so sure. It's a good fingering. It's a cheap fingering, really. But I actually like the three and the four going down. And if we're using this piece in the context of a lesson or a study, let's get that three and that four down. Now. I'm doing something with the timbre of the sound. 
in bar two that's quite interesting. This whole piece is based around A minor. Okay, it starts on A minor and it ends on A minor. In measure two, it goes to E major. And I make a subtle adjustment with my right hand placement. I open up the sound and make it a bit brighter on the E major. Okay, as that tonality changes as we go from A minor to E major, slightly more positive. So we start quite dark and quite warm. And then we go up. So there's, for me, there's a microdynamic swell there. I'm not just looking at it and saying, well, it says piano, I'll play the whole first part piano or I'll play piano until I see something that tells me not to. I want to think about the relationship between A minor and then the E major. So dark, opening up. for a second and then back, E major to A minor, okay, so we've gone all the way around there. So there's quite a lot to think about, the fingering of bar three, the highlighting of the bass, preparing, micro swells, when the harmony gets more interesting, and then coming back. So there's also some interesting things in the second part of the piece. The piece is, as I said, all based around A minor. And at one point, it goes from that minor key to its relative major, which is C. And it does that by going through G. And that, for me, is a real moment of positivity in the piece. And it's a, piece, a moment we want to really highlight. So we start the second section, exactly the same as we did the first. A bit of highlighting of the bass again. And we use an F as the highest note in the arpeggio, and then a G in the lowest note, and that really makes us want to arrive into the C, okay? So just hear how that works. So we're really presenting C major, the relative major of A minor. Um, so if I want to highlight that, I want a little bit more work with the thumb. I want to make that thumb a bit stronger when we have the G and the C. And then I want really the, the, the sound to become quite bright there, quite joyous, okay? So the dark minor. And then here. There's a slight inevitability, let's say, in the second part of the second section, that last line of the, of the little lesson, where... ourselves back to A minor. So we descend down in the bass, C, B, A, and it's that point that you might want to get yourself back towards that darker sound. So if I play the second section, controlling always the melody, I've moved brighter, on to cello a little bit, then back. right hand to be static. I'm moving it with the chords. I'm letting it adapt to the harmony. That's a really important feature. Another thing for you to consider is controlling uh, the overringing of some of the bass notes. Now it doesn't happen much in this piece but it does happen occasionally. Um, where I think it's really important to sort of cut bass notes off um, is when the harmony is changing and you could still have an under ringing bass from a previous chord and, and we really don't want that at all. So at the beginning, everything's being stopped by the onset of the new note. But here, which is bar four, we have the low A and then we go back up the octave to the high A. Now, although these notes are the same and they're just an octave apart, we don't want the sound to be so muddy. So at the end there, I play the A, I dampen it with the thumb, before the onset of the next chord. All I do is replace it. I'm replacing it there on the fourth semiquaver of that beat. So I'm taking just a little bit away. You can also do it after, so you can play the new note and then quickly put the thumb down on another string. If you do it after though, you're still going to get that micro dissonance or that little bl blurring or blending of the sound. So I like to do it just before. That 
was much clearer when I took care of that, that A. Maybe the final thing I want you to consider is tempo. Now it's marked Allegro, which means it should go really quick, but I don't want you to do something fast and scrappy or be slowing down and speeding up all over the place and not keeping a regular tempo. So when you want to do something quick, play it on Allegro tempo as is suggested, you want to be able to do everything musically that I've just suggested, comfortably and almost subconsciously before you suddenly start thinking about tempo. For me, tempo is one of the things that I would put in towards the end of the practice of a new piece. I would try and organise all the musical ideas, all the timbral contrast, some of the fingering options, and then I would see if they would all work as I start to speed the piece up. I want those things to be subconscious, really under my fingers, before I suddenly start speeding up, okay? The worst thing is someone playing quite fast and quite scrappily with no musical ideas. It's actually nicer sometimes if the piece is a little bit under the tempo you might desire, but it's full of interest. Your listeners following that interest, they're following your bass line, your melody, they're following your timbral contrasts, your dynamic contrasts. So their head is full of all these interesting ideas that you're bringing to the table. If their head is only full of the tempo that you're playing at, it suddenly becomes quite boring after a while. It doesn't take too long before you start to switch off. So in establishing your tempo, let's establish all your musical ideas and your technical ideas first, bed them down, and then tempo can be a decision you make a little bit further down the road when it's an easy one for you to make and still remain musical. Okay, so it was short and sweet. It was just a few ideas on this little lesson by Aguado. Enjoy it, get the music from the link below, and try it. Speak to you soon.